welcome. Whatever they say, they're welcome. We don't shush children in this Deneen funeral. There you go. <laughs> so we're really, really delighted um, here at the Hot Village Church to have everyone uh, join us to celebrate the life of John Deneen. Um, I'm particularly delighted because this is uh, probably my last memorial service here and I get to do it with you. So, hooray, hooray. Uh, by all accounts, John was an amazing, jovial, very active, creative, delightful, dapper force in this world. Yes? <laughs> Today, we get to celebrate this amazing life. We get to sing lots of songs, music, 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 of course. We get to hear stories and tell them even silently for ourselves as we move along. And we get to remember with great joy a life clearly lived in spirit and well. John's spirit is obviously here among us. And I know that those of you who knew him, I only met him a few times, but those of you who knew him clearly must feel that spirit in this, in this room and the energy. So before we get started, I thought it might be fun to see who's here. So let's start with family. Anybody who considers themselves family, would you please rise? <laughs> Here we go. Popcorn style, they keep coming up. Raise your hand if you are standing. You can be seated. Okay, anybody who considers themselves a friend from the hot, please rise. Welcome, friends from the Haunt. Anyone who considers themselves friends from Boston or Cambridge, please rise. Welcome, Boston and Cambridge. Anyone who considers themselves a childhood friend, please rise. Oh, look at that! Wow! Anybody who considers themselves a singing friend, please rise! Church, Nahant Village Church. We are an open and affirming church, which means that everyone is affirmed for who they are, where they have been, and where they're going. In other words, you, just as you are, are welcome here, fully alive in your own soul, in your own skin. Welcome. When we gather to remember a life, especially a life lived so amazingly like we are today, we will 
remember also the lives of other people who have died. And you may find yourself surprisingly touched. Even though we are here to celebrate and there will be laughter, you may find yourself a little weepy. And I want you to be okay with that. I want you to know that your feelings belong here. And if you discover that you're sort of feeling really good, but your neighbor is a little teary, feel free to comfort one another because we are John Deneen's compassionate community and you are each other's comfort. So feel free to feel what you feel and to be present to one another. So I would say we are ready to begin this celebration and we're going to start, of course, with song. Good morning. Good morning. As you all know, music was an important part of my Uncle John's life. At our family Thanksgivings at Westways, after the feasting is done, we have family sing-alongs. This is a special song that Uncle John and I sang together. This is for you, Uncle John. May the road rise to meet you. May the wind be always at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your face. May the rain fall soft upon your feet. Jessica, JK, and I and our families, thank you all so much for being here to celebrate a man who had a gift for life. You could say that courted life strategically and joyfully. Jane and I came into his life not by birth, but in the same way many of you did. He welcomed us in and began a lifelong conversation and connection with us. Our mother said that dad was the only one of her, her suitors who had the good sense to court her, her children first. <laughs> he brought our little family to his very cool apartment on T Wharf, gave us rides on his Vespa scooter, and brought us on ski weekends with the Lazy Eight Club, the only club from which dad ever resigned. We had no choice because it was bachelors only. <laughs> Soon, Jane and I were completely charmed, and we marched around the house chanting, Mary John Deline. <laughs> the only time in Jane's life she's been willing to use mispronunciation for effect <laughs> in any of her languages. <laughs> Fortunately for us, our mother began to look at her best friend, Mary Ann Deneen Fairbanks' brother, with new eyes, and she took our advice and married John Deneen. <laughs> While Dad had a temperament that allowed him to always feel near perfect, he had a unique ability to bring comfort and understanding to others. Our small family had been shocked and saddened by the illness and death of our first father from leukemia when mom was so young, Jane was two and a half, and I was just 14 months old. It wasn't dad's way to acknowledge challenges. He simply lifted them by his presence, attention, and care. 
even his usual response of, you're perfect, rather than the more challenging, perfect, shows care to those who themselves might be having a less than perfect day. It is rare for an innate optimist to carry such a deep understanding that life can be hard. His own near-perfect status lasted through the tragic death of our mom, the closing of Gaston Snow Law Firm, the long years of caring for Susan through her painful illness, and then later the challenges of his, the two years of his own declining health. Growing up, we were often aware that many people owed him a debt of gratitude. You could see it when they welled up when they were talking about him, or sometimes, years later, when they told us what he had done for them. But he never told us. This was frustrating to some of his more curious children. <laughs> he was a rock regarding confidentiality. When they say people will take secrets to their grave, Dad has done just that. <laughs> Trust in his respect and love was always well placed. Once we moved to Naha, Dad didn't take our adjustment to our new life for granted. He sat Jane and me on his lap in the leather chair in his study in the new big stone house and told us the latest chapter in the adventures of Sammy the Seagull to endear us to our new seaside life. He had become an instant father, and yet he instinctively knew how to make us feel. And, of course, we benefited from his ability to attract and court other people as well. And soon, our family was welcomed everywhere. Nahant was small enough to feel like a sort of club, and every club he joined was improved by Dad's loyalty, affection, and sense of humor. How lucky my dad felt to live here, especially the past few years. While Susan was ill and later during his own illness, dad had a remarkable record of retaining staff. And true to our training by him, we asked few questions in interviews about skill level. We simply tried to assess whether they would be a good audience. <laughs> of people's lives and felt more that they were under his care than that he was under theirs. I wish there was time to thank all of these remarkable and noble women, but I do want to mention one. Sueli Izaki first met Dad and Susan years ago, and since then she has been a constant in Dad's life, and we haven't let her go yet. When I arrived to visit Dad a couple of years ago and found that he had fallen during the night, I instinctively called Sueli first, and only then the ambulance. <laughs> in recent years, Sueli was sometimes in the position of having to stand up to Dad, something none of us were willing to do. It wasn't easy, but she was always up to the challenge, and he would feel her grace more than her assertiveness. She has been a gift to our family. Luckily for his family, it was always a pleasure to take Dad to his appointments at MGH. He enjoyed engaging with every person he came across, from a fellow elevator rider to the medical professionals who provided his care. When he was in the recovery room after his heart surgery, the nurses grew concerned when they couldn't get him to respond to the usual questions to see if he was awake and oriented. He looked uncharacteristically frail lying there, and I wanted to make sure they understood how high his usual level of functioning was. So I told them that he was still working full time as an attorney. Then one of the nurses asked him, Mr. Deneen, your daughter tells me you're still practicing law. What kind of lawyer are you? He suddenly woke up and with that famous twinkle in his eye responded, an expensive one. <laughs> the medical interventions themselves and the advice he was given mattered little to him. 
Probably because he already knew the secret to living a good life. His exercise bike was used as a clothing rack. <laughs> and every trip to the, his wonderful doctor, Dr. Coley, which involved a review of the importance of good nutrition, was followed by a trip to Heat Street, the MGH cafeteria, <laughs> and next to Kelly's, dad's favorite restaurant, <laughs> for a black and white frap and pepperoni pizza. <laughs> his doctors, but never about their medical advice. Once, when he was in his mid-80s and still remarkably healthy, Dad mentioned that he had been having trouble remembering people's names, a true crisis for him. <laughs> Dr. Coley said, well, if that is all you have to complain about, I'd say you're doing very well. Most people your age are dead. <laughs> considering most people my age are dead. <laughs> These hospital visits could take some time, either because people wanted to extend the pleasure of the experience, or on rare occasions, because it took longer for dad to get a reaction. <laughs> Once, we spent the whole day at the hospital at various tests and appointments. We had also visited, as usual, the Bullfinch Medical Office to look at Uncle Jimmy's portrait and chat with his former staff. <laughs> Finally, at the end of what had been for me a very long day, we went to our last stop to have his blood drawn. Unfortunately, the phlebotomist was unresponsive to Dad's usual blood lab routine, which went something like this. How are you? Responding with enthusiasm from his wheelchair. Near perfect. <laughs> what is your date of birth? 1, 21, 28. But we only have my mother's word for that because I was born at home. <laughs> As they start to draw the blood, you won't find a drop of blue blood. Maybe green, but not a drop of blue. <laughs> On this day, there was still no reaction. So dad turned to me and said, Tell him all the appointments we've been to today. After I recited the list, Dad finally got a reaction when he looked the phlebotomist in the eye and said, so now we're all done, except for building the casket. <laughs> On the last day of his life, I met with the hospice admitting nurse. She looked around at the house full of people and gently told me that many patients choose to wait until their loved ones leave the room before they slip away. I simply nodded and smiled as I thought, not this one. <laughs> After he had gently passed away, Louisa said she had counted 15 of us in the room with him. It was a fitting final scene for someone whose original career ambition was to be a tap dancer with the stage name Danny Deneen. <laughs> he loved an audience. The more the merrier was never as true for anyone else. We're sorry that Dad's gone, not just for all of us and for all of you, but for all those who won't have the chance to have their life, or even their day, graced and elevated by meeting him. Whether it was as fleeting as a courtly tip of the hat, or one of those nods of recognition that was really more like a bow, or a real conversation, or the beginning of a lifelong friendship. The good fortune that he came into my life the good fortune that he came into all of yours. I'm so glad that we'll go forward together, remembering his humor, his ability to connect and console, his kindness of spirit, and his remarkable example of how to live a life fully connected and fully engaged. Thank you.
Before I begin, I just want to recognize for all of you here that I know for sure, and I know my brothers will agree, that the best years of my mother's life were spent with John and me. I'm not sure I can add much to what Martha has just delivered. Indeed, I've had the privilege of being with her as she worked on what she wanted to say to us. Once she settled on her last draft, I copied it to my computer, and I started several of my days recently by reading it. Doing so has made me sad, because it's hard to think that Da, as his grandchildren called him, won't be at all the customary places we have reliably found him, defining by his example, as Martha said, the importance of the simple act of showing up. These places include one sacred to him and to many of us. There's Westways, of course, but more specifically the Granary, one of what I would call his living museums, where he placed a circle of seats and then surrounded himself with multiple artifacts, each of which told a story. My favorite one of these places is the garage at 40 Pleasant Street here in Nahan, where once you navigated your way past his car and notably his green John Deere tractor, you would find two director's chairs facing out toward the yard with John plopped comfortably in one of them. It was as if he had always expected you to show up. Surrounding you on the garage walls were pieces of collected driftwood, a framed article by JK, and notably for me, a picture of my brother Ted, taken when he was in Wyoming at age 15, wearing a cowboy hat with his long, thick hair spreading out upon his shoulders. That photo said to me that me and my brothers were officially a part of those he loved. In all these spaces, a third one being the shed that Rex Antrim built to the left of the house in the Han, with a magnificent view of the ocean, the art, as he would call it, seemed eclectic and without any evident theme, but once you absorbed it and thought about it, you could see the point. Whether someone gave him something or he picked the piece out himself, each item in the menagerie of wall hangings connected to a person or a group of people. The theme, it was both simple and profound. If John knew you, you mattered. Whenever it was I was with a friend who was about to be introduced to Dom, I would always highlight by way of warming them up for the experience, and to meet him was just that, an experience, that he would start the conversation and gently persist in it until, like magic, he found the person we both held in common. You could be someone from the network world of Boston, where you find the connection it seemed before you had even introduced yourself, or from far outside of the United States, and he'd find the relationship that made what was, at the start, two strangers meeting for the first time, a moment of reconnection, a reunion, between two long-lost friends. It was a beautiful thing to witness again and again. Of course, in Martha's and my case, he took delight in the fact that he could untangle for anyone who wished to hear the story about how it ended up that his daughter had married his wife's son. <laughs> except for this afternoon, uh, which, please don't ask, I guess Mark and I will have to take on the work of telling that tall tale now without God's help. <laughs> Being here today brings up such a rich mix of emotions. Our gathering surely makes us feel grief and loss since John is the hub of our wheel, the center of our interconnectedness, and he's gone. Yet we also know he never will be gone. John will always be with us through our capacity to tell and retell, as he did, the stories of our relationship to one another and to him. This oral history has Homeric-like depth and quality, and that is good. For the rest of our days, we can tell one of these tales and feel the warmth of connection that he provided and will always provide for all of us. We live in a world that now leans persistently toward division. Instead of seeking with relentless insistence the tie that binds us together, it seems too often the effort is just the opposite intent, to find the evidence to pull us apart and keep things that way. John lived the life the world needs now. Let us remember his purpose and his example and pursue the daily effort, just as he did, to knit together, to find our mutuality, and in so doing, bring forth and sustain the kind of world that Da carefully built nurtured and now in his absence has left for us to continue to continue to grow and extend. Thank you.
As the Apollo Club comes forward, I want to call attention to Flossie, who is here sitting in her wheelchair, and she was uh, originally the pianist and then the conductor for the Apollo Club since 1958, is that right? Yes. So she's joined us today to welcome us.
and uh, even how, in some ways, uh, I knew John so well in a very important and precious but small space. And to look out and see just the magnitude of the people who loved him, uh, I, I'm just overwhelmed and honored to be here. So I first want to extend my deepest sympathies to John's family. And that's all of you, as we see. Um, and also to the family for giving me the honor. I mean, really the privilege. Thank you so much, Martha, and to all your siblings and your family for this. I was speaking on behalf of Cambridge College about John Deneen. At Cambridge College, uh, in a word, we all just loved John Deneen. And over my eight years of working with him, he became for me personally a mentor and a dear friend. And I will miss him dearly. For nearly 30 years, John was a devoted member of the Cambridge College Board of Trustees, serving as an extraordinary advocate for our mission, our values, and our students. No matter what obstacles or challenges the college faced, John could be counted on to serve as our guiding light. He was the longest serving member of the board with a tenure of nearly 30 years unheard of today. And over the course of those many years, he served on nearly every committee of the board, governance, finance, development, external relations, and of course, given his background, he served on our real estate committee. It was a huge commitment of time, and John made it. He was not a board member in name only. He was present at every meeting of the board and every meeting of every committee. I don't know in my tenure if John ever, ever missed a meeting unless it was related to his health. What was also most surprising and amazing was that John knew something about everything on every committee. <laughs> And he brought to us his knowledge, his understanding, his very thoughtful observations, and also his disarming and charming wit. He never let a discussion get too long or too fussy without chiming in. He would sit in the meeting very calm, very serious, and often quiet. I remember in the beginning, I wasn't sure where John stood on this issue. But this pattern emerged over time. And at the moment when you least expected it, John would speak up with a comment that could turn the tide of the discussion. This was especially true if the discussion had gone on for too long or seemed to be going off the rails, in which case his comment would go something like this. Well, I think we've beaten this one about around, around about as much as we need to. <laughs> Let's move on and make a decision. And I think we should do this, and he'd explain what he thought we should do, because it's the right thing to do for the college. And he was always right. John did not dilly-dally in the gray areas. He was clear, he put a stake in the ground about where he stood. And for him, the matters that seemed difficult and controversial to other members of the board, for John, were always black and white, right or wrong. And he always, always came down on the side of what was best for the students and for our college. I came to rely on this quality in John. And there were moments, and the moments were ones where we were facing our most difficult decisions, the most controversial, the ones that would have the greatest impact on the college. I would look down the table, waiting for John to weigh in, and he would deliver every single time about what was right for the college and what was best for our students. John also served as the clerk of the college for nearly 25 years, signing off on all of our legal and compliance matters and all of our final filings, and there were many. He served in this role until his very last day with us, and we will not be able to replace him in that way or in any other. But of all the positions that he held at the college, the one that was the most important to him was that of serving as our athletic director. <laughs> which occurred when I was interviewing for the role of the president of Cambridge College. He walked up and introduced himself to me saying, I'm the college's athletic director. <laughs> and we are undefeated. <laughs> he was, as you might imagine, in his usual dapper attire, bow tie and all, and I remember thinking, does it look like an athletic director? <laughs> And oh, by the way, the material they sent me, I don't recall seeing anything about athletic programs. <laughs> what I came to appreciate over time that this title and the record of success was a metaphor for how John felt about the college. This upstart, non-traditional college with a very important mission had prevailed despite people thinking it wouldn't survive. And so for John, it reflected the mission of the college. It had prevailed. It was undefeated. 
and he was proud to be a part of the team. At his 90th birthday celebration at the college, we presented John with his athletic director shirt. <laughs> we have now retired his number, <laughs> and it will be proudly display displayed in our John Deneen boardroom. John's advocacy for the college was shown in so many ways. He was a generous donor who used his example of giving to encourage others to support the college. In 2006, in honor of his belated wife, he established the Susan Lowell Wales Deneen Endowed Scholarship Fund. And in 2010, John spearheaded the creation of another endowed scholarship fund in honor of his longtime beloved friend and fellow trustee, Kay Dunn Gifford. Funds from these, college, from these scholarships have touched the lives of countless students and have enabled them to continue to access their education and not be hindered by financial obstacles. Over the years, John introduced us to so many caring friends who became supporters of the college and also provided scholarship support for our students. He was committed in his work with Cambridge College to help level the playing field for those who had been left out and doing so by making college accessible to those for whom it had been denied. And for that, for us, that meant serving a population and supporting a population of people who were older first time in their family going to college, women, people of color, and immigrants. John cared so deeply about our students. John also loved to share with us the things that he loved. For years, he hosted our annual commencement celebration dinner at the Tavern Club, and he was always so proud to have us there to share with us a place that he loved. And shortly after my arrival, John insisted that I should become a member of the Union Club. And he made that happen. Why? Because he loved the place. He wanted me to enjoy it. And he said with a twinkle in his eye, and it'll be good to have someone like you there. <laughs> in reflecting on John's passion for the college's mission, our board chair shared a quote with me that spoke to her about John. You can easily judge the character of a person by how they treat those from whom they expect nothing. Mm. And that was John for us. That was John for our students. That was John for our community at Cambridge College and his fellow trustees. I think fondly about the times John spoke up, again with a twinkle in his eye, about things that we simply couldn't do. He once said in the board meeting, I'm just tired of all the time these accreditors come and waste our time. We just need to stop doing it. We reminded John that we could not operate as a college without accreditation. <laughs> but John cared about our students, and in his mind, it was just a waste of time and effort when we should be spending time caring and taking care of our students. I think fondly about the last time John was at the college with his cane, his briefcase, and of course, looking so dapper as always. As always, we had a routine. I greeted him with a hug. I offered to help, which he always declined. And I asked John, so John, how are you? And he replied, as Martha has said, as always, near perfect. <laughs> and when I heard the news of John's passing, I reflected on a conversation I had with him at our 90th birthday celebration for him. When we had that same greeting, the same exchange, and he said, near perfect. I finally said, John, why do you say that? You know we all think you are absolutely perfect. <laughs> to which he replied, oh no, pointing upwards. When you are perfect, it means you are gone from here. So John, in saying farewell to you on behalf of your Cambridge College family, to you John, our guiding light, our moral compass, my mentor and my friend, I ask you one more time, so John, how are you? And I hear him reply, I'm finally perfect. And I say back to you one final time, but we have always known that all along about you. Yeah. Goodbye, my friend. We welcome the Tavern Club.
one word they can just <laughs> For the two youngest of John's children. John Kelly Deneen was a man of public charm, a story and a joke teller. I want to speak to some of his more private moments as a parent. When JK and I were young, our father took us on a pine tree planting expedition. Armed with feathery saplings, our hands cupped around their clusters of roots and dirt, we marched around our property at 391 The Hot Road. We were wearing hiking shorts with canteens clipped to the belt loops. <laughs> this is serious business. Our older sisters, Louisa, Martha, and Jane, were already seasoned tree planters. Each Easter, our father had given our mother a tree that needed planting, a gift that came with the benefit of his occupying the kids. This time with our father was precious as he worked long days, and he made sure we appreciated that we were creating some kind of legacy with these trees. You can still see them now, large and gnarled, defining that property. Meanwhile, there was the Red Rock Club, started by our father with Jane and Martha, and continued with Louisa, JK, and me. He took his children to 40 Steps Beach early in the morning for calisthenics and a bracing swim before work. <laughs> we touched our toes, we swayed side to side, and waved our arms in circles. After a dip in the ocean, our father still in his canvas sneakers, we combed to the beach for sea glass, especially blue sea glass, and the ultimate find, red rocks circled by white stripes. These were good luck, he told us. Over time, we collected and cherished them. Then came our father's branding phase, during which he was in the habit, with the help of his study fireplace and a branding iron, of burning his initials, JKD, into almost everything leather that adorned his study. <laughs> and this included his briefcase. This was fun for us kids, but I was troubled. I had overheard one of our father's friends say that now my brother, JKD Jr., could inherit the briefcase when he became a lawyer like his dad. I got up the nerve to go to my father and complain. I might want to be a lawyer, I said. I was at the age when hints at certain limitations start to dig into a girl's life, but I wanted to stake my claim. My father went to his study, retrieved a gavel, and handed it to me. I think you should have this, he said. You could be a judge someday. Just like a well-placed sapling, that gift would take root. It would give me strength as I grew up and explored the world of work. In 1982, when our mother died, our father became a single parent. He was struggling under the sadness of losing his life partner of 22 years. His law firm was also struggling. He had trouble sleeping, and one of his refrains, say when I started skipping school every Wednesday, or when JK had a minor scrape with the law, <laughs> Uh, that's just one more thing to keep me up at night. <laughs> but his insomnia was productive. It was during these nights that he planned a compound at Westways on Keyser Lake in Maine, a place in which he would very thoughtfully bring his entire extended Deneen family, his five siblings and all of their offspring together, enriching and bringing closer three and now four generations of family members. And despite our father's difficulties during this time, he became a super parent like a mother and father rolled into one. He kept up with Jane and Martha at their apartments and Louisa at college. He woke JK and me for school each day, pressed breakfast into our hands as we ran out the door, came home from work every evening to face two motherless teenagers and their friends sitting on the kitchen counters. He was involved at our school and he kept the fridge stocked with minute steaks. He told us he was proud of us just about every day, and also sternly stated that he expected to continue to be proud of us. <laughs> Not too many years after that, our father clipped a pull quote from the newspaper and taped it to the kitchen cabinet. It's still there now. It reads, Father doesn't know best, and there's doubt that he ever did. <laughs> Message received. By then, all five of his children had reached stages of life in which it was clearly all on us. He could reasonably expect us to know best and to do best. <coughs> the day my former father died, I had a phone conversation with him, thanks to Martha and Louisa, who found a moment when he was awake and lucid and brought the phone to his ear. Most of his kids and his siblings had been gathered at his bedside, and we knew the end was near. 
I reminded him that I was in Honduras for work. He was struggling to speak, but he made a point of saying a few words of encouragement. I couldn't quite make out all of them, but when I said I'd get home soon, he said more clearly what my five foot six something father always said. I'll be the tall, good looking one. <laughs> I told him he had been a great father. I said I missed him and I loved him, and he said mega ditto. <laughs> These words and these sentiments and others that he shared with each of my siblings were just the right ones to comfort us as we faced what followed. His words weren't just meaningful, they were kind and funny and charismatic and full of life, life that each one of us will take forward. JK will share some of our father's words of wisdom now. had this um, fascination with telephones. Um, he loved phones, he always had new phones. Usually he didn't know um, how they worked particularly well. <laughs> and he was always getting the latest phone and that when cell phones came about, he had a very early car phone and then he had these big massive cell phones. Um, living in California, I spent a lot of time on the phone with him. Um, when he would answer the phone, he would say, it's the old man on the haunt. Uh, or he would say, well, hello there, what planet are you on? <laughs> um, he also uh, liked to talk to telemarketers, I mean, strangers in general. But <laughs> somebody called to sell him a roof or a fence or insurance, he would first um, stop them and say, excuse me, is this about trying to save me money? <laughs> and they would say, well, absolutely that's what it's about. And they would say, well, if there's one thing I have too much of, it's money. <laughs> and uh, he, would, uh, he, would, he would proceed to, to talk to them, um, make, making their afternoon very unproductive. Uh, <laughs> He would talk to them um, for five or ten minutes, and by the end of the conversation, he would have known where they grew up and, and you know what they would want to do with their life. Uh, besides, bother him on a, on a Saturday afternoon. Um, some of his other pieces of advice um, were join every singing group you can, um, which, as you saw, that you saw a couple of his singing groups here. He always said that the Apollo Club was cheaper than therapy. Uh, <laughs> He, um, he was full of wry one-liners. Um, at one time he said, my daughters would use a teaspoon if they wanted to dig the Suez Canal. <laughs> uh, about somebody else he said, he was good at everything, including making sure everyone knew it. <laughs> he, uh, on declining an invitation, to a party after reading about the guest of honor, he said, I don't think there's room for his ego and mine in the same room. <laughs> um, he had a lot of uh, advice about money, too. Um, he said, don't make the mistake of counting other people's money. Um, to, the, to a mechanic uh, on paying a small bit of, at the lo a small bit of small bill at the local garage in Maine. He said, what else am I going to do with all this money? <laughs> um, and some of his other pieces of advice, he, he always said that he would retire when he found something better to do. And he also liked to say that he would take things up, like golf when he was a little older. Uh, he said that well into his 90s. <laughs> um, he said, uh, finally, um, well, he said the secret to a long life he said, keep breathing. Uh, and then when asked um, if he would prefer cremation or burial, he said, surprise me. James in John's life, his beloved sister Jane, his dear daughter Jane, and I was a fond friend Jane. 
John's family chose this lovely short poem because it was his great favorite. After it was read at the memorial for his much-loved friend Peter Callery in Ireland, John committed it to memory and took every opportunity to recite it to his family, particularly his grandchildren. His granddaughter, Megan, has a copy written in John's best handwriting, framed on her bedroom wall. The poem reminds me of John. I imagine him standing on the dock at Westways uh, with a swarm of dragonflies around him. The Dragonfly by Alfred Lord Tennyson. Today I saw the dragonfly come from the wells where he did lie. An inner impulse rent the veil of his old husk. From head to tail came out clear plates of sapphire mail. He dried his wings like gauze they grew. Through crofts and pastures wet with dew, a living flash of light he flew. Hello, everybody. Um, when I uh, came to Nahant for the first time, more than 14 years ago, uh, John Deneen was one of the very first people I met because he was underwriting a concert that I gave at the Nahant uh, early in the chapel. And I'm so proud to say that John was one of my biggest fans. <laughs> Um, on February 4th, I took a walk on the beach with my dog, and all of a sudden, I thought, I wonder how John is doing, I, I, I have to visit him. And in the evening, I opened up Facebook, and, uh, or was it maybe the next morning, and I saw a posting from the family that he had passed away, and then I thought to myself, wow, he was saying goodbye to me on this walk. And then I thought, oh, I really want to sing when they have a memorial service. And I, I kept hearing Danny Boy, Danny Boy, Danny Boy. And I thought, wow, there's so many Irish, great, wonderful Irish songs. Why Danny Boy? And today I know why Danny Boy, because Martha said it. <laughs> this song is for John, no, Danny Deneen. <laughs>
greatest fans. <laughs> Imagine that. A man who was a fan of so many. I'm imagining that there are a lot of you who felt like whenever he was present, you were his greatest fan. I loved what Martha said when she said, he made sure that everyone knew that they mattered. You matter. As we go back into our lives today and on into the rest of our lives, trusting that today is the first day of the rest of our lives, it would be a challenge, but a really good John Deneen challenge to trust that you actually do matter. That you matter to the people that you meet, that you matter to your families, that you matter in this world in which we live, and perhaps most importantly for some of you, that you matter to yourself. Because it sounds to me like John Deneen wanted to be sure that you knew how important you are in this world. How important you are. You matter. Fully connected and fully engaged. What about that? What about beginning this first day of the rest of your life fully connected and fully engaged because we together have learned that this is what that looks like when you become not near perfect, but perfectly perfect. <laughs> fully connected and fully engaged, and now perfectly perfect. John Deneen has now joined the many saints that have gone before him, joined his beloved relationships, joined the people that he loves who have died. John Deneen is one in the Holy Spirit and God has wrapped this amazing human into God's loving arms. And now, perfectly perfect, John Deneen can join you in anything and everything you do. You can channel his his characteristics. You can channel his positivity. You can channel his depperness. You can channel his love for the human condition and the human being. Today is the beginning of the rest of each of our lives. And we, as this compassionate community gathered because of John Deneen, Denny Deneen, because of this amazing man, we are changed. So, the challenge is on. The challenge is on to be fully connected, to be fully engaged, to trust that you matter. Simply the act of showing up may be all that you have to do to be fully you and fully alive for this world. We're in the season of Lent, us people here at Nahant Village Church. The season of Lent is the season of walking with Jesus as the human that he was, walking with him towards the cross, which means walking with him towards his death. And what we are promised is that his death, that death does not have the final word. What we are promised is that when someone <clears throat> dies, when the human being dies, there is this empty tomb time, this in-between time, where we sit still with our relationship with them, and then we rise. <laughs> and then we experience Easter, 
the rising of the spirit among us, and then we experience the rising of Jesus Christ. So we gather in this most amazing time to celebrate John Denis, trusting that he is available now in a new way. You don't have to talk to him by the phone, whether it's a really old-fashioned cell phone or a new one. You don't have to have him at a board meeting. You don't have to have him in the backyard sitting in one of those director chairs. He can be wherever you are, whenever you ask. All is, that is required of you is an open heart. Perfectly perfect means total love, total availability. John Denis is yours if you show up. <laughs> so we are saying goodbye today. We are saying goodbye to this human who has walked among us. But this goodbye doesn't have the final word. You carry the spirit of this day. You carry the spirit of your relationship into your lives. It's a new relationship, one that you are allowed and invited to open to. But it's a really exciting journey. So take the journey, my friends, take the journey and let the spirit of John Deneen live just as he lives in this place, in this connection, fully connected, always. Amen. And now John's grandchildren are going to come forward. <coughs>